James, and thank you, team, this morning. Good morning, church family. How are you all today? That's really, really good. I want you to put on your imagination cap because you're driving at the moment. You're driving along on the road, just, you know, on your way to your destination, minding your own business. And then in your rearview mirror, you see these blue and red flashing lights. And you're being pulled over. Now, instinctively, you know you probably haven't done anything wrong, but there's some physiological responses that come from seeing those lights. And your blood pressure starts to go up and you start getting sweaty palms. And the officer comes beside your window and you wind your window down. Good evening, sir, madam. Can I have your license, please? And by this stage, you really are worried. What did I do? And you start to replay it back in your mind. And there's no reason really for us to be fearful here because he's not yelling at us. He's not saying, you were speeding, why were you doing that? He's just speaking calmly. He's not standing in any threatening way and yet there's this fear because instinctively we know that the guy beside our window has power he has power to fine you issue you with a fine which affects your weekly budget depending on what you did wrong quite significantly If you've done this a few times, he also has the power to take away your ability to drive. He does even also have the power to put you in a holding cell. And he does have a gun. There is that. He technically has the power to take your life as well. And this is why when we get pulled over like that, our body experiences all those physiological responses because we understand his power. And a person won't respect authority. They won't fear authority. They won't respond to authority unless they understand the power behind it. If there is no power, there is no reason for me to comply. If there are no consequences... Why should I follow? And this is an illustration that talks about how important it is to understand God's authority in our life. That God has ultimate authority over us. And we are no strangers to this. There are plenty of spaces throughout the Bible where we can see examples about God's authority, his power and his strength. No one who reads the Bible would ever be left confused about God's ultimate authority. Starting at the beginning, with just a word from his mouth, the whole universe comes into being powerfully. And you can imagine the cosmic uh, explosion of events that threw the stars and galaxies out into the expanse by just one command from God. And then we see how he controls the elements, how he splits the sea, how he closes up the rain, how he smashes the cedars and splits the rocks. His control over the elements and ultimately his power of life and death. By his word, he breathes life into us and by his word, he can snatch it in a second. And so perhaps the most important lesson to learn on this journey of life is how to respect this one powerful God. And it's the key verse in our series that we're going through, uh, Pleasing God, this key verse of Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him. And love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. It's actually pretty straightforward, right? 
It's a simple verse, but profound in its meaning. Honor God and love him with your whole heart. That is a life worthy of living. A good way to spend life. A great philosophy, a good motto. But there's an interesting phrase here, and it's fear the Lord. And I find it interesting because in this verse, you've got the phrase fear the Lord and love the Lord in the same basic idea. How do they actually go together? How do we love God, but at the same time are supposed to fear him? How do we fear God and his power and his authority and all those consequences, yet at the same time love him with all our heart? Can you really love someone that you're afraid of? How does this go together? What does it actually mean? And that is today's journey. If we are living a life to bring pleasure to God, to please him, and fearing God is part of that, what does that actually mean? And what does that actually look like? Well, I start with the idea of thinking that I think it's easy to forget sometimes God's authority because the idea of fearing him doesn't seem to fit much with our new covenant of grace and love, right? We, we promote this idea that God is love, that he's full of grace, you know, the, the Lord Jesus, gentle and loving, and the gospel, the gospel of grace and forgiveness, God not punishing us for our sins that we deserve, but instead pouring out forgiveness and grace on us. So we embrace this aspect of God. We embrace the love of God. We embrace the gospel, which we should. But we can't forget that the God we worship as loving and kind, this God full of forgiveness and patience and grace, is also just. He is a just God, which means he forgives us, but he doesn't forgive us by overlooking sin. God does not overlook sin. His hatred towards sin is pretty obvious. You don't have to read far in the Bible to see it. And it should be. Shouldn't we expect God in all his purity to be just and to hate evil? And we can see an example of this about how he sometimes treats his own people, how his own authority and his own justice gets meted out even to the people he loves the most. Let's have a look at um, some verses in 1 Corinthians. So you want to turn there with me. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It'll be on the screen, but uh, if you want to look it up as well, that would be good. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 6. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and he's speaking of the, the children of Israel in the time of the Exodus. And he says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. And Paul's point here is that the people he's talking about were miraculously, miraculously saved. God had gone out of his way to perform wonderful miracles. You'll remember he called Moses out of the burning bush, sent him back to Egypt. He displayed his power in front of Pharaoh through plagues and um, sufferings on the children of Pharaoh. And God led them out of there miraculously through a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud in the day, this supernatural display 
for them 24-7 in front of them so that it was obvious they couldn't forget it. And then he talks about them being miraculously provided for where food and drink came naturally uh, out of the desert from God in a way that uh, kept them alive. And what he's saying here is the ones that knew God's salvation power and experienced all the wonderful miracles of God were the exact same ones that were judged by God because of their unbelief. The loving God who rescued them through grace and compassion also punished them because of their disobedience. And Paul says this is a warning to Christians too. Because the anger of God is not just an Old Testament idea. Let us look at some examples in the New Testament. You've got uh, the, the wonderful move of the early church where God had turned up through the Holy Spirit, anointed the believers and powerful things were happening. People were healed, even raised from the dead. You've got the expanse of the Christian church, thousands of people becoming Christians, turning to God. Uh, The gospel transformed the people, then the nation, and eventually the Roman Empire. Just a, a beautiful display of the power of God. And yet we have this story. In Acts chapter 5, only five chapters into this incredible story of a couple named Ananias and Sapphira who went along with what everyone else was doing. They were selling their properties. They were selling their land and bringing the money to the disciples so the disciples could distribute the money according to the needs in the church. And this couple sold their land but decided to keep back some of the money for themselves and then pretend like they gave all of it. And this is what happened. Acts 5, 3... Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell it or not sell it as you wished. And after selling it, the money was yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You were not lying to us, but to God. And as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. And everyone who heard about it was terrified. This is not the Old Testament. This is the New Covenant. These people are Christians. And they deceived the people. And God struck him dead. This is the church, right? He was deceiving the apostles and lying to the Holy Spirit. And he paid for his life for it. And later on, his wife as well and notice the result everybody who heard it was terrified in other words great fear uh, came into the community because it was a sober reminder that the God of love and grace is also a just God it was a lesson that was so important for them to learn at the beginning of this fresh movement of the Holy Spirit on the earth A reminder that even though they were saved, not by works, but by the grace of God, and even though they had the Spirit in them, God was still to be respected. And also, in Revelation, years later, you've got the Lord Jesus speaking to the churches. There were seven churches he spoke to, and one of them, the church at Laodicea, he says this, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The modern way of saying that is you make me sick. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to church people. Not those evil pagans around about. These were church people. The Lord Jesus was saying this. You know, the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that one. You know, the, the Jesus that didn't defend himself at the trial, the Jesus that died on the cross for you, that one. 
spoke such harsh words. And some people have this misunderstanding in the Bible. They say the Bible presents a picture of two gods. The God of the Old Testament is angry and the God of the New Testament is loving. And that is so not true. In fact, the character of God, both love and justice, is seen all through the story of God and through the history of his people. Let us not forget, of course, that the very Jesus who took the nails and the crown of thorns, the very Jesus who died for our sins, is exactly the same one who will come back and judge the world. In Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 10, he says this, And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testify about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. We hold dearly sometimes to the image of the soft-hearted Jesus. The Jesus lying in a manger. How cute. The Jesus soft and kind who wouldn't condemn the woman caught in adultery. Who spoke kind and encouraged words to the tax collectors. But the terrifying reality is that he is also the one who determines where we will spend all of eternity. We like verse 43. Everyone who believes in him will be forgiven. But we must not forget the other part, that he is the one who judges the world. The very one who forgives is the very one who condemns. Herein lies for us the important balance of understanding fear. A balance that we see all through the Bible, that God is to be feared. But that same God that is terrifying and all-powerful in nature is also loving and kind. Fear in the context of love. This is the beautiful balance of Christianity. And it helps us to understand the context and meaning of fear in the Bible when applied to God. Because fear can mean a lot of things. I mean, I, I can speak of fear as being terrified to the point where I would avoid something, right? Fear as in terror, I'm going to avoid that thing. Or fear in this way that that thing is so terrifying that I sure am glad he's on my side. That kind of fear. I tend to use the word honour. Honour and respect. When you read the word fear, you must understand its balance with his loving kindness. God can be terrifying, but he loves me and I'm glad of that. He will judge the world, but he has provided a way out. And so long as I'm walking in his way, I don't have to worry about condemnation. And that knowledge leads to me to be thankful for his love, but at the same time respectful of his lordship. I love the Lord. I love him dearly. And I can see in the course of my life how he has poured out his blessing. But I take him seriously at the same time. I'm not the kind of person that would give in to these things that were done in secret because we think God doesn't see them. We need to be the kind of people that respects God. Person who respects God, they won't make excuses for sin. They'll deal with it, they'll confront it. A person who respects God will seek to please him, whether anyone's looking or not. A desire to please him, to take him seriously. A person who respects God will love him. A person who respects God will serve him. They'll devote their life to him. 
And this is what we need to understand when we talk of fear of God. That this level of fear is respect. And it influences the way we live. And there are a couple of well-known verses that you'll be quite familiar with that I want to remind us of. Uh, Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Proverbs 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And these verses talk about wisdom. They talk about knowledge. They talk about understanding. If you want to be wise, if you want to be understanding, then we have to understand that we are ultimately answerable to God and those who don't recognize this are only going to live for the temporary things the things they can immediately see and measure and imagine. Living with a healthy fear of God is wise because it changes the way we live. You'll note that. If you know you're going to be accountable to something, then you will approach it differently than if you won't be accountable to something. If someone's going to measure your efforts at the end of your effort, you will approach that effort differently. It's kind of like studying, right? I can study something to learn something, but if I know there's going to be a test at the end, I'll study it differently, perhaps more diligently. You, know, you can study a subject for credit and you will study that so that you can pass that test. Or you can audit a subject for information, in which case you will approach that very, very differently because there's no test at the end. And it's the same with life. If we know that we are accountable to God, we will live differently. Perhaps the closest analogy in this is one of parent and child. I think it's a really good one. Parents discipline their children and so there is this healthy fear, which is appropriate. Not that the children are terrified of their parents, but there's a healthy fear because they know they are uh, being disciplined by them. But they also know that the parents love and protect the children. Discipline and love and protection, all at the same time. A healthy balance. This is how it actually is explained in Hebrews, if you remember. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you, as he does all his children, it means that you're illegitimate and you're not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God disciplines, God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. There is an ultimate test at the end of life and God is the judge. We are accountable to him. And everything we do, all our choices, all our priorities, all our attitudes can be influenced by that one truth. If we live with that in mind, we will live differently. To take God seriously means to live to please him. And it is a worthy way of living. And that is what Deuteronomy 10, 12 is all about. Now, Israel, what does the Lord God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. It leaves us with a challenge about how we can live like that. I'm talking about in the everyday. I'm talking about when you go home this afternoon or when you go about your business tomorrow. How do we live this? What does it look like for someone to respect God? 
What does it look like for someone to live in a way that pleases him? What does it look like to love and serve God with all your heart? And looking for answers to those questions is a worthy pursuit. Now, the answer to those questions could be very individual. How I answer those questions might be very different to how you might answer those questions. And how I answer these questions this week might be different to how I might answer those same questions in six months' time. This is a journey of knowing how to please God. But what does it look like to live a life of respect, to live a life that brings pleasure to God, to live a life wholly devoted to love and service? I call it a posture of respect. That is where Christian maturity comes. When we learn to respect the God who is the one who measures us. A while back, uh, there was a popular movement that came out with wristbands and caps with the WWJD on them. Do you remember that? Stood for What Would Jesus Do? It came out of that book um, that was written in his steps. And I think that's the right approach, that in, in everything we do in life, what would Jesus do? And so in every decision we make and in every way we think and every priority we set, we're thinking all the time of how to bring him pleasure, how to respect him, how to follow his lead. I like to think of it by framing it in a slightly different question as well. Is what I am doing bringing pleasure to God? Is what I am doing bringing pleasure to God? It's a slightly different question, but it helps and it's powerful. And again, this is individual. As you go about your daily tasks, is what I am doing bringing pleasure to God? Is he proud of me today? Is he smiling at me today? Is he that loving father that would say, you did good. You did good. Good job. Well done. That's our goal. That is the posture of a life that means something. To live a life for the one who has ultimate power, a life beyond just self-fulfillment. I want us to pause for just a a moment, perhaps you might like to close your eyes if that's how you connect with God. And I want to leave you a minute to take the time to consider those questions. It's not a time for making bold promises to God. That's not what I'm asking. It's not a time for regret either. I don't want you to sit there feeling sorry about the sins of the past. I just want you to think of those questions, particularly that one, is what I'm doing pleasing to God? The others as well. What does it look like for me to respect him? What does it look like for me to please him? What does it look like for me to serve him and love him with my whole heart? And I just want you to take a, a moment now to pause and listen to what the Holy Spirit might say to you. Let us take a moment to pause before I pray. Heavenly Father, those of us who take you seriously want to know how you'd like us to please you. And in the quiet, Lord, may your spirit bring to our mind a word or a picture 
that will help us to know, Lord, what is the next thing we have to do? Lord, show us what does bring you pleasure in our individual lives as we seek to walk a journey that is honouring, that is respectful, that is walked with confidence because we know that you love us. Lord, we have this balance of respect coming out of the, the fear and love that we understand. And so we, we do want to bring you pleasure. Not just because of fear of the consequences if we don't, but because we love you as well. Lord, take hold of our motives, our thoughts and our actions that they will be honouring in every way. Thank you for your forgiveness for those times that we don't get it right. But thinking of, not thinking or dwelling on what has passed, but latching on, Lord, to what you're going to show us next. Pray, Heavenly Father, that we would bring you pleasure with the life we live. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.